that might surprise you now that they're talking about sequencing everybody's genomes. I did tell them they might need more of me one day, <laughs> but you know they'll 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 need them and they'll have to do it. So whatever. Um, I'm based in Cardiff uh, at the University Hospital of Wales, and I'm also an honorary research fellow with the University of Cardiff. And I'm in what is now the Inherited Tumour Syndromes Research Group. So that is the UK's only dedicated research group to inherited tumour syndromes. And that's because Cardiff has a good track record in familial bowel cancer and polyposis and such like. So that's, it's not random that I find myself there. I'd just like to acknowledge the assistance of St Vincent's University Hospital there, the National Centre for Colorectal Disease in Dublin, in supporting me in going around the world, doing my job, and being here today, actually. And I'm a member of council of the International Society for Gastrointestinal Hereditary Tumours, and I was recently re-voted back onto council, and you'll be seeing Sue Clark later today. She's our fantastic sort of captain of the team. She keeps us all going within insight. Um, and so, on we go. There's a slide about insight. We provide help to anyone, and that includes healthcare professionals and patients. You can go and look up your syndrome up there on that um, tab up there, or you can go straight there with the URL for Lynch syndrome there. We just had a meeting in Auckland, which was fun getting to, and a bit more fun getting back from actually. Um, and after that I spent a week with our team in Melbourne because that's where they host our internationally acclaimed database of Lynch syndrome variants. And my day job is helping people decide we found a change in a Lynch gene, is it actually causing disease? Can we use it to um, test a relative to see if they have it as well? And the little picture there, just in the bottom right, is that in 2021 we will be having our two yearly conference in New York. So that's slightly closer to get to from here. Anyway, uh, you can refer a healthcare professional to there. Uh, any, any of us in Insight are happy to give advice. And I also try to put advice down in the form of textbooks and all sorts of stuff. So um, find us one way or the other. If not, Tracy can always send you my way. Well, in terms of an update on what's been happening in the world of Lynch syndrome over the last year, I could speak all morning, but I have to keep myself to about three quarters of an hour. The point is, there's lots of good news. Once you start getting a certain amount of information about something, you can build on that and it gets better and it gets better and better and then it starts going like that. So when I think back to 1992, when I was in the room when MSH2 was discovered, it was actually in the bar of the Danish Medical Association in Copenhagen, if you're interested. And wow, so much has happened. And stuff that we thought might be going on way back then turns out not to be the case, and nature's been having a laugh at us. And as so often in medicine, we're right, but not for the right reason. So I'll intrigue you with that later on. Um, gyne cancers, we had an international consensus meeting in Manchester, and Neil Ryan's going to talk about that this afternoon because that has literally just been published. So we now have some sort of consensus statement that you can refer doctors to and that they can um, reference their practice to as well if they want guidance as to how to, how to help you in that respect. Um, the good Sir John will be here to talk about aspirin and there's really um, exciting stuff about that as well. We um, have been getting further with what's called the Prospective Lynch Syndrome Database of which I'm one of the steering board members. I thought I'd cover how and why do colorectal cancers occur in Lynch syndrome? Because that's something that's intrigued me ever since day one in 1992. Something about Lynch syndrome and the immune system because those two aspects are now coming together and that is becoming, that's telling us not just about cancers in Lynch syndrome but about cancers in general. Um, something about NICE guidance DG27 which I spent 17 years of my life trying to get onto the, um, get onto the um, system. And something about who? 
So the Prospective Lynch Syndrome database, it collects data on patients worldwide. Some of you, your data may be in there. It's all completely anonymous. It's just numbers. It's just age, when you were diagnosed, if you got a cancer, when you got it, where was it, what was taken out, how often have you been having surveillance, did you get a second cancer, etc. So it's a very simple database, but from this we can study what happens with people with Lynch syndrome in real time almost, and there's data from worldwide. Finland, UK, Europe, North America, we've recently got a huge amount of data from South America, uh, Australia, New Zealand, large chunk of data coming from the Far East. So we can now start to look at comparing patients with Lynch syndrome in different parts of the world to see if given the same gene, do they get the same things or more of this or less of that, whatever. We can start looking at that and nature's natural experiments may, may tell us more. <coughs> Sorry. We follow people as individuals on that database because technically families are irrelevant. Yeah, it's a completely undefined thing. You can't, we're all part of the family of humankind if we took it to the nth degree. So what we do is we just study individuals. We know exactly which variant, which mutation they've got, and that links with our database of variants. So we're only following people who we know have got a disease causing change in the gene. That means that we get rid of a lot of noise that was in previous older work. The database itself is held in the Radium Institute in Oslo and Professor Paul Muller was um, the prime person who set it up and the curator is now Dr. Mev Dominguez Valentin and she hails from Peru, if you were wondering. And we now have more than 50,000 patient years of observation. So this is just about as good as it gets. Yeah. Um, and there's the website address for it. You can go and have a look at it. A healthcare professional can go and look at it. This is all completely free and open to the world. So, as Mev was from Peru, and I pass through Paddington at least once a week, I thought I'd get a this little fella, and I squashed him into a box and sent him off from Mount Pleasant. And she emails me back, so nice surprise I got today, so beautiful. And thank you very much for this nice detail. Now Paddington is in Oslo and soon to be in Peru. Good idea to be PLSD mascot. And the detail she was talking about was that I'd written on the back of his little label, please look after this database, thank you. <laughs> so, if you go to this database, this is the first page you get to, you can see that uh, on the left you can select which organ you're concerned about the risk of a cancer in, um, what age the person is, what gender they are, and which gene they've got a change in. And then it will give you that line based on probably about 20,000 patient years of data for MLH1. That's colon cancer, but you can specify all cancers, rectal cancer, endometrial, whatever. Those little vertical bars show how much variation there is and the line is merely the average point. So a particular person at a particular age with a particular gene and whatever is somewhere between those bars. Why they might be at the top end or the lower end is something that intrigues us and me in particular. And that's somewhere else we can now start going digging. We can look, we're thinking of looking at people with individual variants, at least the commonest ones to see if they're up here or down there, because then we could really fine tune the lines down to specific variants, not just a gene. Because other work I've been doing shows that it may come down to very specific changes in genes. You can imagine, there's hundreds of thousands of parts in your car, and it'll go wrong in a slightly different way if you tinker with that bit or that bit. So that will also tell us something about the biology. So, the Prospective Lynch Syndrome database, it has produced uh, many publications now since we set it up. And the first one was basic data on the incidence and survival in Lynch Syndrome. That was based on about 15,000 patient years. And then the incidence of and survival after subsequent cancers, because we wondered whether if somebody's already had a cancer, 
Is that indicating that they're at extra risk compared to the average person with Lynch syndrome? And no, it's not. It's just kind of random whether you get one and whether you get the second one. Just because you've had one doesn't make it more or less likely you get a second one. But there's an awful lot of number crunching to go on to eliminate bias in the numbers because um, of, of the way it is um, collected and looked at in a sense. So we do have on those graphs, you can select somebody who has had cancer and somebody who hasn't because the lines aren't quite the same. It's not because you're at a greater risk, it's because um, you've survived the first one and it's getting through that. I won't go into the stats, it's, that's a whole week's lectures. Um, then we've got uh, the survival up to 75 years and that was on about 25,000 patient years and this paper took a bit longer to get into press. We looked at people who had MLH1 mutations, variants, who were subjected to different follow-up. So they had colonoscopy at different intervals. And we have to thank our Finnish colleagues for that because they're the oldest place that's been having surveillance and they've been having it every three years since they started. So it's a kind of one of those natural experiments. We could compare them with everyone else who was getting colonoscopy between two and one yearly. Because the Germans all volunteer and have it every year, and they get it every year. And UK aims for two, but manages about two and a half, three, right? And all points in between. Point is, we can compare like with like, because we're never ever going to be, run, be able to run a clinical trial to decide what is the best interval for colonoscopy. We just have to look at what has happened as a natural consequence of all the variations and see what happened. And trying to get this into press got a lot of pushback from reviewers. They, they thought, oh, this is just weird. No, no, uh, endoscopists were saying, oh, you, 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 you're just not doing it right. You, you're not looking at it correctly. Can't possibly be the case. We spend our whole days taking polyps out left, right and center, blah, 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 blah. Okay, so what we saw was this graph. And when you look at it, the fins are the blue line below and the green are the ones above. So just to highlight that, the people on one to two yearly colonoscopy are the green line. And this is the colorectal cancer incidence by age for people with MLH1 in that PLSD database. The people on three yearly in Finland get slightly less cancer. That's because people in Finland get slightly less cancer. So when you correct for that, we can't show a difference. If we ask the scientific question, is there a difference between patients when we subject them to different frequencies of colonoscopy? No, there isn't. And you have to stand back and respect it and think, okay, so what's going on? Why did we think there might be a difference? I'll just seed that one in your mind. This one took Tony Seppala. Yeah, did I get that right? <laughs> Seppala. Seppala, thank you. Uh, surgeon in Finland who's been looking at the data in the PLSD. And he's been looking at it in even more detail once we'd got even more data. And he was looking at the stage of cancer in Lynch patients diagnosed on colonoscopy, on people on surveillance. And, of course, you might naturally assume that the longer it has taken a cancer to grow, the more advanced it will be. That is definitely the case in the general population, and it's why we go in for surveillance programs and trying to find cancer early. So it made all sense to assume the same was going on in Lynch and give people frequent colonoscopy and ever more frequent colonoscopy. So what did Tony find? Well, he looked at the colorectal cancer found on surveillance and how long it was after the last time somebody had had a good and proper colonoscopy, which is important. And years since the last colonoscopy, so you've got less than one and a half, one and a half to two and a half, two and a half to three and a half, more than three and a half years. And when we look at the stage of cancers diagnosed at those different times, it's strange. And it's strange because you would expect 
at the top you've got the stage ones, the earliest cancers with the best chance of survival. The stage twos, the stage threes, and the stage fours. And what's curious is that if you put the ones and twos together, yes, there's definitely a sort of, you can sort of see a trend that there's more twos the longer the interval, but there is not an increase in the number of stage threes and fours, which are the ones, frankly, that kill people, which is weird. Yeah? So no wonder the reviewers were saying, this is just weird. And I'll show you why it's weird. If we look in the cancers that occur in the general population, in the UK, the different stages break down roughly like the bar on the left there, where roughly equal numbers of patients have stage 1, 2, 3 and 4. Now we've instituted national bowel screening in the U bowel cancer screening in the UK, and we're finding ever more earlier things. The cancers that are now turning up are largely 1s and 2s, and it's meant a huge increase in survival, a reduction in complicated surgery, and it's had that huge effect by going for things and finding them early. So compared to the patients with Lynch, if you just stand back, you think, this is different. These people do not behave like average members of the general public. And the assumption that doing colonoscopy and taking stuff out would behave in the same way as people in the general population, we, we have to just stand back and admit that it is not the same. There's a huge amount of controversy about this. The gastroenterologists are saying, yeah, what about the quality of the colonoscopy and all this, that and the other? Well, we just have to stand back and look at it. Um, it's not the same, and we have to rethink, because everybody makes assumptions when we, when we start doing stuff. So, this reminded me of when I was at St Mark's, and this dear lady was there as a research fellow, and... Wendy was responsible for, largely responsible for the UK's National Bowel Cancer Screening Program. So she'd studied polyps in the general population and cancer, and that if you took these polyps out, people would stop getting cancer in later life, and this would cause a huge reduction in bowel cancer in the general population, which, as I showed you, is being achieved. It, it's phenomenal. It's one of the best cancer screening programs in the country, in the, in the world, in terms of the effect it's having, because it's so many people. And Wendy, I can still hear her saying, you know, Ian, the more scopes you do, the more adenomas you find. So in studies where people had had more frequent colonoscopy, this is just people in the general population, if you count up the number of polyps you find over a given period, you find more if you scope people more often than if you do it less often. So you think, well, what's, what's going on there then? So they must come and go then. Some polyps must come and then go, naturally. Just, and at the time, John was talking about getting Cat 2 from Cat 1 going. And the thought was, well, is Aspen doing something to that process? Is it making more of them that come, then go? Because then you wouldn't see cancers further on. It just makes you think about the barge, because the mindset at the time was, once you've got an adenoma, that's there. And if it's going to do anything, it may change into a cancer. But the concept that things come and then they go, mm, that really challenges the, the underlying thoughts. So we end up with a few sort of logical steps here. We know colonoscopy in Lynch absolutely, definitely reduces mortality. But it may not be doing it for the reasons we first thought. It definitely prevents at least those bowel cancers that would have arisen from an adenoma, from a polyp. We have to admit that because lots of polyps have been taken out of you, I'm sure. I could probably half fill a bucket. Yeah? <laughs> Point is, everybody can form polyps, some more than others. It may not necessarily be anything to do with Lynch. It may be just a fact that we're all human and you eat the right stuff and that happens. We know it doesn't prevent all cancers and maybe it simply can't. Because remember those graphs? That was people on surveillance. It, it's not as if it's come down like that. These cancers happen, and they happen at the same rate in people whether they're having scopes or not. So we have to admit, sort of, it's not defeat, it's just nature's laughing at us. And how is she laughing at us? 
Unlike the general population, stage is not strongly associated with the time since the last clean scope. So, uh, this, this, this doesn't fit the rules, does it? More frequent colonoscopy in Lynch does not seem to be significantly more effective and less frequent. There are confidence levels on this. It may be if we could study a million patient years, you, you could show that there was definitely a... But there's not time to do that. There never will be. So we just have to work with what we've got. We just have to admit, Lynch syndrome is strange. It doesn't behave according to the rules. And something else seems to be going on. So, quite apart from all the controversy and the gastroenterologists chucking bricks at the epidemiologists and Tony arguing he does perfectly this, that and the other, stand back and just sort of think, hmm, something going on. Okay. So why does loss of mismatch repair, that's what MMR is, cause tumours? This is something I've been wondering about because I did my PhD on DNA repair years back and I worked in a lab where we were putting chemicals on cells and trying to cause mutations and seeing what, what response the cells came up with. So everybody jumped on the bandwagon, well most people jumped on the bandwagon 20 odd years ago. Well, these tumours, these cancers have an increased mutation rate and it makes the adenomas grow quickly because we scope somebody today and in a year's time they've got a cancer. So there were no adenomas today, so that adenoma must have started the day after, and it only took 364 days to become a cancer. In the general population, it's like 5, 10, 15 years. So, oh, must be quick, right? That is if all the cancers come from adenomas. The interval cancers in Lynch patients on frequent colonoscopy with adenoma removal imply adenomas in Lynch grow quickly. That's, that's, look at it, and... That's what you have to conclude. There's a raised mutation rate in tumours that have lost mismatch repair. So 2 plus 2 equals 4, doesn't it? Ooh, that explains it. Ooh. Yeah, but some of us have never, ever been convinced. My good friend Ian Tomlinson, who's professor in cancer genetics here in Birmingham now, published way back when, in 1996, The Mutation Rate and Cancer in an esteemed journal. And he and Sir Walter Bodmer made the point, you do not need an increased mutation rate to explain cancers. The mutation rate in all of us just sitting here is sufficient to explain a cancer. The fact that you see an increased mutation rate must mean something else. And I'll come on to that with the immune system later. Later, they produced this paper on selection, um, of, of cancers, that the cells have an increased growth advantage, the mutation rate in cancer, ensuring that the tail does not wag the dog. In other words, assuming one and putting two and two together does not equal four. And later on, Rick Fischel group in the United States, Rick was instrumental in um, um, discovering and working out the mechanism of DNA mismatch repair. His team found that apoptosis induced by overexpression of MSH2 or MLH1. So if you have more of these mismatched proteins, it induces this thing called apoptosis. All right, you're all wondering, what apoptosis? That's all right, it's a, it's a Greek word. So what is apoptosis? Well, it's sort of related to ptosis, right? Okay, but it's not. You'll know that these animals have webbed feet, but we don't, okay? So our hands and feet develop as like little um, ping pong bats, yeah, in the womb. And what happens is we have genes that turn on and cause apoptosis of the cells in between the digits. So they separate. Every now and again, a human turns up with, with some webbing because they've got something in that gene, okay? Now, um, that's programmed cell death. The body designed it that way. Make a little paddle and then just chop it down here and you've got five digits. Easy. So that's what humans have. And apoptosis is simply programmed cell death. It's a natural process of cells where the body builds stuff up and then it knocks it down to get what it wants. A bit like um, potter's wheel and you know clay and stuff, that sort of effect. So it's a natural process and it's there to make our bodies the shape they are and to prevent us suffering stuff 
um, for when, when cells go a bit wild. So why does loss of mismatch repair cause a tumour? Well, DNA is damaged all the time. It's a fact of life. Yeah. Um, anyone been to California or the United States? Yeah. You know, you know, everything says known to the state of California to cause cancer. Yeah. The, the two chemicals they don't mention are water and oxygen. Okay. So they ought to put that on every bottle that, that water attacks DNA. DNA can go rusty, you see, and that was my PhD <coughs> looking at how DNA goes rusty. So it gets damaged all the time. That's a fact of life. That's why DNA repair arose with the very first things that got DNA. Okay, so if there's hugely excessive damage in DNA, the cell just curls up and dies. That's like weed killer or bro bat, yeah? It just kills it. That's what's called a toxic death. Nothing can survive that. If there's a fair bit of damage, but not enough to just kill the cell outright, <coughs> the cell will decide Oh, too much damage to repair. This is this is, you know, um, a write-off in sort of car terms. Uh, I need to activate the chain and kill myself for the greater good of the organism I live in. So a cell will activate apoptosis if it's got too much damage, and this is what chemo and radiotherapy do. They try to activate apoptosis without causing too much toxic cell death, because cancer cells are kind of on the brink a bit. And, and if you just push them a bit further, they'll go, eh, and die. Trouble is, they've acquired changes in genes that mean that they are resistant to apoptosis, as I'll, as I'll come on. So it's a, it's a tricky thing to get the balance right. If there's a bit of damage, not too much, the cell will sit there, not dividing, while it mends itself. And once it's got sufficiently mended, it will then go and divide because the cell doesn't want to divide with too many mutations, but it knows it can never get to zero. You'd never get there. And in fact, cells don't do that because they always need a little bit of variation. But anyway, the baseline mutation rate in all our cells, as Ian found, is small, but it's not zero, and it is sufficient in itself to explain a cancer. So we have to park the idea, if there is a raised rate of mutations, that's probably important in cancer, but not for the reasons we first thought of. Normal proliferation is therefore, you can never quite get to 100% max, okay? Because of two and three. There's always some cells saying, give me an hour, I need to do a bit of mending. Or I need to just throw myself off the cliff for the greater good. So cells get the signal to do two or three from mismatch damage repair. That measures how much is wonky with your DNA? And another protein called TP53, which is found to be mutated in just about every human cancer. So these cells, have, if they've got something wrong with mismatch and TP53, can proliferate 100% and it just lasts and it acquires mutations which, you know, it just, ha ha, I'm out of here, you can't control me, I'm just dividing. Now the difference between a 99% proliferation rate and a 100% proliferation rate is about 10 times more than you need to produce a cancer. You only need a tiny little increase in proliferation rate to get you a cancer. So that explains why that occurs. And it's a very dangerous state. And there's some references there if you want to go for it. So moving on, our friends in the Institute of Pathology in Heidelberg we've been working with because they've been looking at how lynch cancers arise and the immune system. And we know lynch cancers show signs of immune response. They're large, they're large cancers, they stay local, they tend not to spread. There's lots of these lymphocytes which are the um, immune system's army, they're soldiers, um, and there's camps full of these lymphocytes around a cancer. And you can see those down the microscope and it's like what happens in inflammatory bowel disease. And when you look at the genes, all, all the immune genes are turned on. Azel there in the photograph, or Matthias and Matthias, found that the little crypts in the cell, in, in the bowel uh, mucosa, one in every square centimeter of bowel 
has lost a mismatch repair. So when you multiply that by the surface area of the inside of the large bell, it means that there's 10,000 of these in anybody here with Lynch syndrome. And yet, in a lifetime, you might get not one or two cancers. So bear that in mind. What these little things do is that they express abnormal proteins that wind the immune system up. They're abnormal and they, oh, right, the immune system thinks, oh, there's something foreign here, got to go for it. And so what happens is, is that around the bottom of these crypts, that, that's that section rather than cut through that way, you see lots of immune cells, these lymphocytes, these T cells, and they're sniffing around. There's something wrong here. There's, you know, uh, you know, no smoke without fire sort of thing. What Matthias and Azel have found is, is that as patients get older, they get more of these crypts, they start climbing. And yet, that is not the trajectory of the cancer. Because what's happening is, is that these abnormal crypts are immunizing you to protect yourself against your own predisposition. So there's two balancing forces. Hence the idea that if we could make a vaccine to give you 40 years immunization from these little crypts at the age of 15, that would be an advantage. Uh -huh. Okay, right. If you look in patients who have no cancer, they have no T cells that have been wound up. It's all green. Yeah. If you look in a patient with a microcytes, with a, with a, uh, a cancer that is not like the ones that occur in Lynch, an MSS cancer, no, no, no T cells have been wound up. They're all green. If you look at somebody who develops an MSI cancer sporadically, as about 8% uh, of bowel cancer patients do, wow, that's wound up some lymphocytes. You can see it's lit up orange and red. And if you look in Lynch patients who have never had a cancer, you find the same thing. So this shows us that your T lymphocytes are being immunized against your own cancers, which is protecting you. So, as well as the immune cells, antibodies also go up. These are the proteins in blood that stick to foreign things and help the immune system to wipe them out. So that goes up with age as well. Azel has also found that you can get flat cancers in Lynch, not polypoid ones. She found the needle in the haystack. These are inherently difficult to spot in a colonoscopy. Not impossible, but it's just difficult. So she proposed that patients with Lynch can get adenomas in the top loop, like anyone does, and then they turn into a cancer in the way that you are predisposed. But there's also these flat ones that live in the surface of the bowel, and they're like mushrooms living in your lawn all year, and then at the last moment they pop up. Yeah. So nobody could spot those, it's nobody's fault. So there's two different ways of getting them. So there's a colonoscopy, colonoscopy is looking at a mucosa. There's a polyp and it goes that way. You can find that, but that's sort what you can't. Here's John's PhD student who actually found a CAP2 polyp and it's on that slide. And on the left is an adenoma, that's benign. And the bit on the right is cancer. So you can see this is a cancer that's grown from an adenoma, so that certainly occurs in Lynch syndrome. If you look at the staining for the MSH2 protein, it's been lost in the adenoma while it was benign. Then it became a cancer. So we can work out the stages in which these changes happen. And from that you can deduce that actually sneakily, some of these ones that live in the mucosa suddenly become a polyp. So there's at least three ways of making a cancer in Lynch kind of two of which don't fit the standard polyp way of doing it. So that starts to explain things. And they've looked at the relative proportions of the different pathways. And they note, pre we don't put all the pre-malignant lesions on because their number greatly exceeds the number of cancers in the model. And Sanatan Booker in the Netherlands has recently been doing some work showing that PMS2 patients only do the polyp pathway at the top. That's why their risk of bowel cancer is so much less. Yeah, That starts to now explain these curious differences between patients with mutations in different genes. What's the relative contribution? Well, yeah, you've just seen that. That was out of order. 
Um, anyway, so we've fallen into a logical trap of assuming there's very rapidly growing adenomas. And we have to think of better ways of doing it to get at the half that don't come through the polyp way. Aspin's probably a really good way of doing it. Vaccine may be another way. Uh, and there are other ways in the wings. Uh, maybe I can talk about that next year. Uh, why then do cancers um, get through the system? Okay. It's because they evade the immune system. They acquire steel helmets, all sorts of things, masks, way of not being seen by the immune system so they're not, well, they're not wiped out. Uh, there's at least four different ways there. And um, I wrote a recent review for the Journal of Pathology on cancer pathways in Lynch and immune escape, as it's called, um, with esteemed colleagues. And the three little compartments are that in the beginning, you get an abnormal cell, and the T cell will see it, it's abnormal, it kills it. And that's happening all the time, in all of us, probably more in you, if I can put it like that. But if one of these cells manages to come up with a way of grabbing that lymphocyte by the throat and saying, you're not going to do anything, are you? That's what PDL1 and PD1 are doing. And then the tumour learns not to present the abnormal proteins, and it hides, it's under the radar then it can be away. But that means a lot of um, unlikely things have to occur, so it is a rare event compared with the number of starting tumours. <coughs> How do lymphocytes get where they're needed? I have to be married to this lady whose life's work is studying where lymphocytes get. So that's a weird coincidence. Uh, she's not always like that at work. She's just been <laughs> awarded a professorship. So I had this idea last night that Lymphocytes are like soldiers, they have to defend the body, but they're angry young men, and they have to be bottled up in a fort, so they're kept in lymph nodes, right? But they have to know where to get to. How do you know which station to get out in London Underground? It's because there's a sign on the wall, isn't there? So it works a bit like that. So there's a fort with thousands of Roman soldiers, like a lymph node, and there's these little forts with some soldiers who've been ticked off to be warned, and those are the lymphocytes that have been wound up by the crypts, okay? They're the, they're the, go out there, light a bonfire when you see something. So here's a lymph node, and there's special blood vessels in there to allow the lymphocytes to come in and out, to talk to their mates. This is the fort, right, where the army is kept. And normally, the white cells get out of your blood to a site of injury or inflammation. And they do that by rolling along the inside of the blood vessel and ooh, going out. And it's like they need an, a homing address. And it's a selection of chemicals. But first it's like Velcro, then they sniff and see the fire, then they're through there, and then they're off, crawling. So, a bit faster. All these chemicals uh, are present in cancers, but the blood vessels in cancers are abnormal. This is another way in which cancers avoid being seen. Normal blood vessels on the left, lovely normal. On the right, tumour blood vessels, complete rubbish, right? Lymphocytes can't get out of those. So what is all this telling us about cancer? A person with Lynch syndrome gets naught, one or two cancers. Yeah, that's how we look at it. Of course, that's absolutely important if you're a patient, yeah? You get hit with one cancer. Goodness knows, that's enough of a brick to get hit with two is even worse. But <coughs> maybe we should start thinking, a person with Lynch gets a million minus 999997. Okay, I'll go quick. That's the way of looking at it. And it, maybe somebody like me gets a thousand minus 999.7. Yeah? If we start looking at it like that, then we start concentrating on the 999.997 bit. Quick bit about nice guidance. Um, something I've spent a large part of my life recently working to get implemented. And last year, I pointed out that it was a difficult job getting it implemented. And in the last couple of days, great news, because Our Lady has seen on TV back there. Um, oh, of course, I was the last person to learn. I learned uh, patients in Wales to be tested for bowel cancer gene. So I'm going to personally thank the Chief Medical Officer and the Chief Scientific Advisor Health for 
getting up and getting on with it and managing to get it going. That is a great advance because that leads and the rest will follow. And I felt moved to tweet yesterday. Here is the World Health Organization. It covers the world, it is part of the United Nations, and it has some nice offices in Geneva that one day I intend to at least use the toilet thing. <laughs> right. Because that's a good test of a place, actually. Um, okay, the WHO issues these blue books. They are the definitive instruction manuals for pathologists worldwide, and governmental health agencies, and this, that, and the other. So if it says in one of these WHO blue books, that the lesser spotted blue bearded lymphoma shall be called henceforth blue. it has to be, right? So this is the fourth edition of the digestive tumour book and there's about 20 of them covering everything and that's from 2010 and it's kind of the observer's book of bowel tumours, right? What you see, you have to call it this, that's the name and this is what it does, right? And it's written by the experts and I'm now roped into the team of experts for the fifth edition and it's been expanded that we now have a whole chapter on genetic tumour syndromes of the digestive system. We've just done breast cancer, we'll be doing gynae cancers this year, etc. So, um, I might be shot for showing this because you have to sign all this paperwork about you will not go public on this, this is United Nations, oh God, you know, and we're just trying to save lives, okay? Um, but, you know, some of this can sometimes be sensitive, but I don't think this is. So we now have a defined section, 15.113 on Lynch syndrome. So nobody in the professional world should be ignorant about it. Yes, it is a professional failure if they are, because they have not read this book. So this actually is something you can slam on the table. It cannot be ignored, it cannot be denied, it is here. At the end, we're going to do a book of simply all the genetic sections from all the books in one book. Yeah, which, is a, which will be a first uh, and an achievement. Right, so just to finish up, lots of good news. Um, going in aspirin later in the day. Uh, we're getting there with the prospective Lynch syndrome data. We're also doing very exciting stuff with the mutation database in Melbourne. Um, maybe, hopefully, more on that next time. Um, and we're learning something about how the immune system works in familial bowel cancer, especially Lynch, and how all that goes. Good news about the NICE guidance and WHO and more. So I'll leave it there because I've prattled on for long enough.